Hey guys, this is Wraith, author of the gay vampire romance Everdark that you are about to listen to, performed by a multi-actor cast. The podcast would not be possible without her Grace Reed studio, which provides the excellent voice talent. And of course, the support of the Wraith Rain members who are subscribers to my site, wraithrain.com, which you will learn about down below and in the podcast. I hope you enjoy how the talented actors bring these vampires and their world of darkness, mystery, and eternal love to life. Now let's get down to it. Last time on Everdark. Julian, with Damon's help, found his way into a blood den, a bar that's invisible to humans where vampires go to feed. Julian ends up meeting a childlike vampire named Sophia Strange, who reveals that Julian nearly lost his second life because of who his master is. We now turn back to Christian, who chooses Balthazar to turn him into a vampire. Everdark, Episode 11 not the same. Christian woke from his dreams of a silver sea in waves. The first wave pushed him to the shallow of consciousness. He felt the light weight of cloth over his body and a soft down pillow beneath his head. Yet he also felt the waves flip him end over end into the churly, churly of that area where the sea still reigned. But the land was calling. He was aware of breath and heat against his back. It was more pleasing than the comforter or pillow. It moulded to him, cradled him, and kept him safe. Yet he also felt he was resting on a bench, and he felt skin, skin pressing against his own. This skin was welcome. It belonged to someone who cared for him deeply. He could feel the caring in the soft, stroking touches of his back. His eyes fluttered open. He was safe. He was happy. No beach, no water, just a bed and a comforter tucked up to his chin. He didn't move other than to blink. There was no pain. He felt refreshed and utterly comfortable. One of his secret pleasures between adventures with Julian was lying in a luxurious bed and just being. His mind emptied, his body lax. He could stay like that for hours. Sometimes he would have an audiobook playing in the background or some music. He would drift between sleep and wakefulness. He'd finally go downstairs when he smelled food cooking, as Julian tempted him with pancakes or burgers or something else delicious. For a moment, he thought it must be one of those days where he had nothing to do other than to simply lay about and enjoy the comforts of his bed. But that feeling was almost immediately dashed as he felt another person move behind him. A large, male hand slid around his chest and someone stretched out against his body. A sleep-roughened voice asked him, You are awake already. Surprising. But there is so much surprising about you. Pleasing, too. And Lord Balthazar Ravenscroft's voice brought everything back. The city of Pale Stone. The attack. His nearly dying. His decision to become a vampire. The fact that Julian was somewhere in the city, lost, alone, and scared. Julian needed him. He sat up abruptly. The comforter tumbled down and Balthazar gave a groan. Mmm, cold. You're letting cold air in, Balthazar whined and tried to draw Christian back down onto the bed and beneath the covers. Christian oiled out of his grip and stood up by the side of the bed. His head spun a little and he was aware of the cool air circulating around his bare skin. He was naked. Buck, freaking, naked. What happened after I fell asleep? No, after he commanded me to sleep this morning. His ass didn't ache. He felt nothing to indicate he'd been ill-used in any way. He turned to face Balthazar suspiciously, though, and with not a little ice in his eyes. The vampire lord was lying on the bed, chest bare and hair rumpled. Balthazar looked incredibly handsome, and there was this devil-may-care half-smile on his lips that indicated he knew it, too. Not necessarily in an arrogant way, but as if he recognized a fact and wanted Christian to notice this fact, too. Balthazar's eyes left his and slipped down Christian's body, making him keenly aware of his own nakedness. Where are my clothes? 
Christian demanded as he cast his gaze around the room. He quickly closed his eyes as his vision kept doing odd things. He could see the individual threads on the comforter and the individual flecks of color in Balthazar's irises. He breathed in and out for long moments before he opened them again. His hands tightened on the comforter to anchor himself with all the myriad of sights and sounds that all seemed to want his attention at the same time. I'm afraid they had to be destroyed, Balthazar answered and tried to look sad about that, but his laughing eyes belied that. They were caked with blood and dirt. They weren't exactly fashionable either, even without all of that. With his eyes closed, Christian's sense of smell decided not to obey him, and he could smell everything, from the cooled wax of the candle on the bedside table, to the fresh scent of laundry detergent, to Balthazar's scent of cinnamon and cloves, to the remembered coppery smell of blood that had his stomach rumbling. Christian grimaced, and the sense retreated slightly, his vision fixed on Balthazar, and somehow looking at the vampire lord seemed to center him. Related question? Where are your clothes? Christian asked dryly. Christian did not cover his own nakedness, even when Balthazar stared a moment too long. He did not let others' bad behavior cause him shame. I don't sleep in clothes, Balthazar answered. It's not healthy. Why were you sleeping naked with me? Christian's voice was crisp. Is that a trick question? Balthazar raised his eyebrows but then he pulled back the comfort of her a moment to show Christian that he was wearing a pair of yellow silk pajama pants. I'm glad that you confused my skin with silk, though. I would have put you in some of my own things, but I didn't wish to disturb you. And in case you're worried, I kept the comforter between us all night, even when you tried to remove it. Why would I try to do that? Christian snapped. The vampire lord's expressive eyebrows rose. Wouldn't you know better than me? They were your actions, after all. Christian stared at him stonily. Balthazar sighed and scrubbed a hand over the back of his neck. It's natural for a fledgling to seek his master's body. It's comforting. You were holding me. I wasn't holding you. I wouldn't have wanted either of those things. Christian's arms crossed over his chest. He could still feel Balthazar's arm around him. Balthazar stared at him without blinking one of those strange silver eyes. You minded that. Is that a trick question? Balthazar stared some more. You don't feel any sense of... Love for you? Need to obey you? Wanting to be with you forever? Christian filled in what he imagined Balthazar was going to say based upon his overheard conversation with Arceus. Balthazar, who was raised up now on one elbow with his legs stretched out, looked both hopeful and worried. Something like that. No. Balthazar blinked, and his mouth moved a bit before he repeated, No. Christian shook his head. This is your bedroom, isn't it? Certainly smells like you. You have clothes in here, don't you? You're not really the same size as me, but anything will do for now. I don't smell bad, but wait a moment. We need to go back to what you feel towards me. Perhaps it's not some kind of overwhelming emotion, but... I feel nothing. I don't know you. Christian slid out of the bed, having to avoid Balthazar's grasp and headed over to a closed door that smelled of cedar. He guessed this had to be a walk-in closet. He opened the door and was pleased he'd been right. A long, rectangular room was before him. There were various built-in shelves where clothes were neatly folded, shoes stacked and accessories like watches and cufflinks, incredibly expensive ones, set out for easy accessibility. There were also rows of shirts and pants lovingly pressed. From Balthazar's comments about his own clothes, he would have guessed the man was into his appearance. But the closet just cemented it. He doubted there was anything in this closet that wasn't designer. He felt Balthazar watching him as he pulled open a drawer and found underwear. He grabbed a pair and slid them on, telling himself they were laundered and there was nothing sexual about wearing them. He didn't bother with any of the tailored suits, but looked for more casual, comfortable, and practical clothing. He actually located a pair of jeans, and was yanking those on when he felt Balthazar behind him. He spun around and should have fallen on his ass, but managed to catch himself at the last minute. Christian, Balthazar's voice, and surprisingly those silver eyes too, were kind. 
He was standing in the doorway, not exactly blocking Christian's way, but definitely trying to get his undivided attention. You've just gone through an incredible trauma. Maybe we should sit down. Realizing that he was not in any immediate danger, Christian finished buttoning and zipping the jeans as he interrupted Balthazar. Julian, you said you were sending your people out to look for him first thing. Have you? Where have you sent them? H have you called Julian's phone? I assume you have it since you're clearly familiar with us. Much too familiar. A flicker of consternation went across Balthazar's handsome features. He really wasn't one to have a poker face, at least not with Christian. Christian tried not to think why Balthazar seemed so affected by him that he couldn't hide his emotions. They did not know one another. He had no reason to feel friendly or kind or whatever it was he felt. This belief that becoming his fledgling would cause emotions like love or attachment to bloom in Christian's chest had been proved totally wrong. So he didn't believe that was affecting Balthazar either on the other end. No, the man felt a connection to him before they had met. He's watched the videos, and he's likely spied on Julian and me for years. Balthazar drew a hand through his thick hair that fell in dark locks across his eyes as he lowered his head. My people were instructed to go to the hospital and wait for him there. That was the most likely place he would return to find you. But they got there too late. He must have been bedded down very near the hospital and left literally as soon as dusk fell. It's surprising that, as a newly made fledgling, that he was awake so soon. We've tried calling him, but he hasn't answered. Ridley is in the midst of trying to ping his phone now so we have a better idea of where he is. Christian froze in the midst of pulling on a high-necked cable sweater in a soft grey. Something about what or how Balthazar was saying this clued him in that it hadn't just happened, but instead had occurred some time ago. What time is it? Christian demanded to know, feeling somehow naked without his own phone. He didn't wear a watch, and that was how he always knew what time it was. It was also likely the only number that Julian would pick up for. Again he read consternation, and perhaps a bit of guilt in those silver eyes. An hour past sunset. You let me sleep! Christian hissed. His emotions, normally so in check, suddenly slithered out of him and snapped at Balthazar. He was shaking with rage. He turned away from the vampire lord and took in deep breaths to steady his suddenly unruly mind. What was wrong with him? I did let you rest, Balthazar agreed. Of course I did. There was a quick rustle as Balthazar stepped towards him and went to put a hand on his shoulder. Too quick for even his brain to know he was doing it, Christian moved out of Balthazar's reach while lowering himself into a fighter's crouch. He and Julian had learned how to fight. They'd had to in some of the places they'd been. Don't touch me, he growled. Balthazar's eyes narrowed as he took in Christian's stance. He stepped back and put up his hands as if to show he was unarmed and meant no harm. I won't touch you. I'm not going to hurt you, Christian. Christian's lips writhed back from his teeth and he felt his incisors ache. You were in bed with me without my permission. You broke your promise to me about Julian. You said you'd wake me. A fledgling normally sleeps at least 24 hours after being turned. But I was going to wake you as soon as we had news of Julian. Balthazar said firmly, shutting down the stream of words that wanted to come out of Christian's mouth, no matter how he tried to hold himself back. He ran a hand through his hair again, and a master always holds his fledgling during the first sleep. If he doesn't, there was something haunted in his eyes. The fledgling is left bereft. I am not bereft. I would not have been bereft, Christian shouted. You are so sure about that, but you don't know what you're talking about, Balthazar said with a slight burr of anger in his voice. It was good to see something other than the laughing good humor out of the vampire lord. It made Christian feel both better and worse. I heard what you said to Arceus about a fledgling having no choice but to love his master, but I assure you that you don't have my love. He choked that out. Love was the most sacred thing to him. He gave it only to a few. This vampire thought to take it from him. He shook his head in disgust. You were right when you told Arceus that such a thing wasn't real love. It's just manipulation. Balthazar's pale cheek flamed, and his silver eyes sparkled with genuine righteous anger. 
I have never hoped for that. What I hoped for was that you would wake up knowing you were safe and cared for and that you belonged. I hoped that you might look upon me as the man who gave you eternal life. The man who was going to help you find your friend. Maybe I hoped for a little gratefulness. Just a little that would start. Balthazar shook his head without finishing what his hope was. I can tell you that the alternative is hideous. If I could have just sat by your bedside and held your hand, I would have. But that is not enough. And you wanted to be near me too. Subconsciously, maybe, but for certain. I can read minds, Christian. Julian doesn't have his master spooning with him. I'm sure he's fine. No. Balthazar cut him off with a sharp wave of one hand. No, Christian. He is not fine. The damage being done to Julian being away from his master is far greater than you know. It could be permanent. Every month, I give away two free books on Amazon. These are often in the same series so that you can get into some of my other worlds and creatures. One of my most popular book series is a multi-book, high fantasy gay romance retelling of Cinderella called Cinders and Ashes. The audiobooks for Cinders and Ashes are also read by Edward and Hannah. It's how I met them. I give Cinders and Ashes books away often, and if you want us to let you know when the next free books are happening, just join my free book email list. It's a simple form, put in your name and email, and the link is posted in the notes down below. The anger mostly drained from Christian. Balthazar was not lying, he could tell, and he could also see that the vampire lord was worried about Julian. Genuinely worried. That took the fight right out of him. I... I am grateful for your help. He swallowed. The shaking rage had stopped. But I... I don't like to be touched. Not unless I'm the one to initiate it. And, and you... I don't know you. But I, I am grateful. If you just let me borrow these clothes, I, I will go find Julian on my own, and we'll be out of your hair. Balthazar was staring at him again in that shocked, perplexed way. Christian, it doesn't work like that. Haven't you heard a word I've said? Christian's back stiffened again. He knew he didn't have data. He knew he should be asking for it. But instead, he was snapping and yelling and behaving in a completely out-of-control way for him. Doesn't work like what? He asked, still sharp. You don't leave your master. Not on the first night you're turned. Not for decades of nights, Balthazar explained. He shook his head violently. There's so much I didn't get a chance to tell you. All of this would have been explained before you were turned if things had gone the way they should have. Decades. Balthazar expected to be a part of his and Julian's life for decades. Christian was shaking his head. No, 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 I'm, I'm sorry. I, I knew you hoped that this would lead to something between us, though I, I have no idea why, but it's just not going to happen. You've helped me and I'm grateful, but I, I need to leave now, Christian said. He turned from Balthazar to look for socks and a pair of shoes that might fit. He found some brown loafers that were actually comfortable. Balthazar was far more built than he was, but they had almost the same shoe size. This outfit would do for now until he got to Wingate and changed into his own things. While Julian might not be at the manor, he would likely be near it. I need to get back to the house. Call him on the landline. Maybe he's even watching the house, waiting for me to return. I can see you're very eager to go. Balthazar's tone was neutral. His stance was not at all aggressive, but Christian was suspicious of him as he swung back to look at the vampire lord who still stood in the doorway. And you're going to let me go? Christian asked knowing even as he did so that it wasn't likely that Balthazar would tell him no, even if he really had no intention of letting him leave. You spoke about mind control and manipulation before. I can assure you that, as an Iros, that I am quite skilled at it. But I will never use it against you, Balthazar said, and a look of such disgust crossed his features that Christian had no doubt about the truthfulness of that statement. But... Christian also heard a but. You are very logical, scientific. In all of your videos, it's clear that a cool head is one of the benefits you bring to your partnership with Julian. When things are at their most dire, you act with as little emotion as possible. Balthazar said, not answering his question exactly, but Christian felt he was leading around to it. 
Are you suggesting I'm doing that now? He hardly felt like his usual cool-headed self at the moment, but maybe he had fooled the Vampire Lord. No, I am suggesting you are doing the exact opposite right now, and I think you know this, Balthazar answered, dispelling any hopes that Christian had that he wasn't coming across like a crazy person. Christian's hands fisted at his sides for a moment, but he didn't disagree. It was pointless. But I'm going to reach out to that logical side of you now, the cold, hard, calculating side that examines every situation without emotion to convince you that leaving is not something that you should even consider doing. Balthazar did not try to approach him again, but the vampire lord's voice was tender and luring. There's a logical reason to stay? Quite a few. He shifted his stance and began carefully. Christian, even if being viciously attacked last night was something you can simply ignore, you're becoming a vampire. Right now, every cell in your body is changing you into a different species, with abilities that are, are miraculous. If you think that doesn't have an effect on you emotionally, you are deluding yourself. Christian didn't respond. He was thinking much the same thoughts as Balthazar, except he was trying to not think too hard on this transformation. He hadn't even glanced into the mirror over the vanity to see if his eyes were silver like Balthazar's. He was avoiding the whole vampire thing. Pretend you walk out that door. What is your first step? Balthazar asked as he gestured towards the bedroom door. To go home. Christian mumbled and bit his lower lip. He sounded like a child after having had a terrible day wanting to retreat to the safety of home and his room. Of course. Balthazar's face went pained for a moment. Of course, you want to go home. But I can't. He made it more of a question than a statement. No, you cannot go home. Physically, of course you can. But you are not who you were when you left there last, Balthazar told him, gently, kindly. He leaned his back against the threshold. Now, let's keep going with this thought experiment. You leave here and go home. You only have twelve hours at most to find Julian, and feed, and find a place where you'll be safe from the sun. What will you do? Block out the windows at Wingate with cardboard? Maybe. Feed. Maybe you'll find a neighbor's cat or dog and drink from them. Is that possible? Can we drink blood from other animals? Since humans are animals. No, we can't. The truth is that while you can survive on non-human blood for a time, your mind goes... Balthazar made a circular motion by his temple and one hand to indicate insanity. Are you sure? Have there been any studies done? For example, that drinking from cows versus cats? Like peer-reviewed double-blind studies? A smile twitched the corners of Balthazar's mouth. Christian stiffened, affronted. Yes? Exactly like that. Balthazar looked even more amused. Yes, of course there have been. Believe me that, outside of the diehards that worship drinking from other sentient beings, that most of us would love to be able to drink from livestock, from time to time at least. It would be so much more convenient and less complicated than having to feed from humans who might run off and tell everyone about us. Oh. We've turned some of the best scientific minds into vampires, Christian, just to work on this problem, Balthazar explained. We, you've turned scientists? Christian had to admit that he was surprised, but it was only logical. Yes, of course. Don't worry, or maybe hope, that we have Einstein or Curie down in a basement somewhere. Those who are too famous can't be turned. Too much possibility of exposure again. But people who would have been in their sphere have been found and turned before anyone heard of them. That makes sense. Christian nodded, pleased at what sounded to him like some very logical thinking. He was falling into his normal state of following arguments. So let's go back to you realizing that you have to feed only from humans. I bet you're thinking that a blood bank or a hospital is a great idea, right? Balthazar lifted his head as if to offer him a chance to figure out what was wrong with that. Security. There's a lot of it around blood supplies. I would likely be seen, maybe even arrested. Also, I'd be stealing from patients who need it. Christian's heart fell. So you must take what you need from a real person. A real, live person. 
You must somehow lure them away from others who care for them or are simply looking. Balthazar made a gesture with one hand as if opening a curtain and then closing it. Then charm them enough so that you can get close enough to actually bite them. And you don't like being touched by strangers, so this will be a lot of fun for you, I'm sure. Christian swallowed shallowly. His mouth was watering at the thought of blood, but his stomach was churning at the same time. And Balthazar was quite right about the touching. You're intelligent, Christian, so you already know it won't be easy to feed from a person. And one of two things, or maybe both, will happen. Balthazar's jaw flexed. You will either kill them as you messily rip their throats out in your overwhelming hunger, or they run away, screaming about vampires. You then race after them, snap their necks, and then start feasting on the dead body because, again, overwhelming hunger. You or the corpse is likely to be discovered and the existence of vampires revealed. Christian crossed his arms tightly over his chest. And remember... This has to all take place at the same time that you have to find Julian and obtain a secure place to sleep for when dawn comes. Balthazar started checking things off on his fingers. Now, let's add some more things to this picture. You're already experiencing some of the benefits of being a vampire. Better eyesight, hearing, smell, etc. But they aren't doing you much good right now. They're actually getting in the way because you have no control over them. Christian agreed with him there. He actually had a headache from his vision freaking out. And that doesn't even get you into the gift you have from being of the Iros bloodline. Balthazar laughed grimly. What gift? You can control other people's minds, but before you can do that, you'll have to learn to stop hearing minds all around you, Balthazar said. He gestured around them. Iros vampires learn to hide their thoughts. That's why you aren't hearing any. This house is set away from the other homes, giving us space so we aren't listening to our neighbors' every mundane thought, or even the interesting ones. He brightened at the latter, and then went on seriously again. So you'll be hearing people's thoughts, body freaking out, hungry as hell, while trying to find Julian and a place to be safe from the sun, all in twelve hours or less. Christian straightened and said with a confidence he did not feel, it does sound daunting, but I'm good at figuring things out. I can figure this out. Balthazar looked like he had expected Christian to think that. Maybe he was reading Christian's mind right there and then. I left the best part for last. The people who killed Julian's parents and sent Celine and Heath to kill you tonight. They're still looking for the two of you. Just because you are vampires now does not mean they will not kill you, Balthazar said with cold precision. They are more likely to put you down now. A newly born fledgling without a master is rightly considered a threat to our security. You will do something that will reveal our existence. You will cause trouble. You must be ended. I see. I think you do. Now, Christian knew that leaving Balthazar at that moment was a mistake. He needed data. He needed training. After he had that, then he could leave. But not before. How had he not seen this? How had he missed it? Why was he so ready to run off? So why... why did I not think of this? I mean, I see it now, but... Christian was surprised by how small his voice sounded. He cleared his throat and said far more firmly, My mind is not clear. Again, that tender look. Of course it isn't. How could it be? Christian, your ability to control your emotions is a good one. You've been acting like you don't have any. You do. Believe me that you are a mess right now, and that is not a weakness or a flaw in you. That is normal, even for someone as high-functioning as you are. Christian buried his nose in his sweater and smelled Balthazar's scent. It was oddly calming, and he just breathed it in again and again. I... I need Julian. I, I can't think about anything else until he's safe. Yes. Balthazar nodded as if this made the most sense in the world. Once Julian is with you, you'll feel better, more secure. Julian is home, after all, isn't he? It was shocking to hear his relationship with Julian so easily analyzed by a complete stranger. He guessed that there was far more in those videos they posted for the world to see and speculate on than he wanted to consider. 
Things about him and Julian and their caring for one another, deeper than blood brothers. At that moment, there was a brief knock on the bedroom door. Balthazar called for the person to come in. A young woman, younger looking than Christian and Julian, maybe in her late teens, appeared in the open doorframe. She wore a pair of black boy shorts and a cut-off T-shirt. Her short, dark hair stood up on end. Balthazar, she said, her voice hushed and whispery. Ridley, were you able to ping Julian's phone? The lazy, laconic Balthazar was gone, replaced with a man very much on point and in charge. She shook her head but quickly added before either Christian or Balthazar could be disappointed. No, but that doesn't matter. I've got something better than that. A friend who I tipped off saw Julian. In fact, he knows where he is right now. Christian found himself drawing near to Balthazar as his heartbeat sped up with excitement and relief. They were going to find Julian. Don't keep us in suspense. Balthazar was already reaching for some pants. Where is he? In the dagger, the siren's blood den, she said. Balthazar was furiously frowning. How did he get in there? He doesn't have a siren mark. She shrugged. I don't know, but my friend wasn't the only one who noticed him. He says he's overhearing people plan to grab him and take him to the Order. There's a bounty on his head. Bounty? That can't be good. Balthazar let out a shrill laugh. Wonderful! Another mess! Another! Well, nothing has ever gone right before. Why this? Come on, Christian. Looks like you're going to get your first night on the town as a vampire much earlier than I'd hoped. Join us next time for Episode 12, Rescue. Many people have asked us if there are ebooks of the Everdark series. Yes, now there are ebooks as well as Everdark merch. Ebooks are available in PDF, EPUB, and Mobi from our own merch shop. Just follow the link in the notes to the Everdark series to read on your phone or any device. And check out the t shirts, mugs, art prints, and pop sockets while you're at it. Your support really matters to us as small creators, and any purchases go directly to supporting the creation of more stories, just like Everdark and Dragon's Reign. Thanks, you guys. The Everdark Podcast by X Aratare is performed by Edward Fox, Adam Riley, Jay Thelis, Bruno Devant, Kelly Michaels, and Hannah Hart. Edited by Matthew Prince. Continuity by Adriel Wiggins. Everdark is produced by Wraith Rain Publishing in association with Her Grace Reads Studios. Copyright 2022 by Wraith Rain Publishing.